Welcome to Anchor Church. Welcome, guys. Thanks for being with us this morning, worshiping with us, and, uh, and hanging out with us this morning. So glad to see so many of you connecting and talking. Really glad that you're here this morning and, uh, and, and just part of this worship service today. It's Father's Day, and like Brian said, Father's Day and Juneteenth and Ryan's birthday. Where are you at, Ryan? You're in here somewhere. And uh, there, there's just so many, there you are, so many good things uh, happening today. So, but I, I am glad that you're here and glad that we're able to worship together and uh, want to talk a little bit with you about the work that Jesus is doing today. So we're going to dig in, dive into the message today, and then I'll make some applications for us as, as we go. But over the last few weeks, we've actually been looking at the ascension of Jesus. And it's a doctrine that I have not uh, you know, studied at length or in any real depth other than just understanding that he ascended to heaven. But I didn't understand all the things that were connected to the ascension of Christ. Meaning when he ascended into heaven, he was uh, seated at the right hand of the Father. I understand all of that. But from that place, he is now engaged in a ministry uh, different kinds of ministries, actually, different things that Jesus is doing presently uh, that I think are important for us to understand. And, and I think, I think for what, what it means for us is that there, there's work that Jesus is calling us to do that's in line with the work that he's doing now. So uh, as I think about that, uh, that to me was something that I felt just uh, in, inspiring. I felt like it was interesting and even just felt led uh, also by, uh, by the Spirit, but also even by just some good confirmation from a godly man who, who spoke into my life and said, hey, I think we should take that message on Ascension Sunday, and you should break that up and really talk about each of those components. And so just submitted to that, and, and actually I'm trying to do that with you guys. So today, uh, well, I should, I should say last week, we looked at the fact that the gifts of the Spirit are actually in, uh, tied to, directly tied to the ascension of Jesus. He ascended on high and he gave gifts to men. And so I had understood the gifts of the Spirit and understood that he gives gifts of the Spirit, that he gives the Holy Spirit and that he gives us the gifts and he produces fruit, but I hadn't seen them connected to the ascension. And so that was interesting to me. That's part of the work that he's now doing, which is giving gifts to men and uh, obviously bringing them to life, giving them his spirit, but then uh, filling them with his power and giving them gifts. And so we talked about that last week. And then this week, I want us to look at the fact that Jesus is now ascended into heaven and he is interceding for us and he serves as an ambassador for us. So intercession and advocacy are things that Jesus is presently doing uh, on our behalf. That's the role he plays as now having been ascended to the throne. So I think the ascension of Jesus is, is obviously important uh, and it's essential, but, but not just for what it means about Jesus, although that's the most important part, but especially and even what it means for us too, if we're tied to Jesus or connected to Jesus or the biblical doctrine for this is united to Jesus. So if we're united with him, and he has ascended and is doing things there, then we should be united in him with the things that he's doing. I think that's an easy enough argument. I hope I can win, win you on that one. Well, the, uh, the implications for us uh, are tied to these verses. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. I just want you to see this, and then we'll move into the actual meat of, of the message. But Ephesians 1, verse 19 through 22 says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him, this is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realm. So the same power, that we, have, we actually even see this in Romans uh, chapter two and Romans chapter eight. There's, there's a, I think in Romans chapter eight where it says that the, the power that raised Christ from the dead now dwells in you, dwells in your mortal bodies, will raise your mortal bodies from the dead. So. There's a number of references, at least a couple that I, that I know of that say exactly this, that this mighty power is at work in you. It's the same power that raised Christ from the dead, the same power that has seated him at the, at the right hand of the Father, the same power that is now at work through his spirit. It is all inside of you. It's inside of those who believe. That is, that is such an extraordinary statement it just begs the question, for me anyway, am I experiencing that kind of power in my life? 
Am I tapping into what is available to me? Uh, and, and I think rather than sort of seeing that from maybe a lens of sort of, you know, knocking you over the head, making you feel guilty about that, I think what I want you to, to ask or just wonder is, well, what is, what, what is that power? What, what, what ability would I have? What ability do I have? What, what, what is available to me? And then secondly, I think is a natural question, which is, okay, how would I tap into that? How would I access that? And so I would, I would want you to, to, to study that and to think about that. And that's actually what these next few sermons are about. Last week, this week, and the next couple of messages. Well, he says, and I've got to go back to verse 20. It's the same power, same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and the same power that seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Then I want you to see this, verse 21. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ. We're gonna talk about that next week. So that's the work that he's doing and I'm I'm gonna hit that next week. So we'll skip it for now, but he's put everything under the authority of Christ, under his feet and has made him head over all things. And it's this last phrase I want you to see as well, for the benefit of the church. Jesus is ruling, he's reigning, he has gone through uh, life on earth and death and burial and resurrection and now ascension back to the throne. And he has done this, not only for his own glory, not only for the glory of God, but here we learn for the benefit of the church. There Jesus is, physically risen from the grave, physically ascended to the throne in heaven, actually doing work for us, actually blessing us, sharing with us his inheritance and all of this for the benefit of the church. Ephesians chapter two, verse four, read this. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. Remember, it's only by God's grace that you have been saved. Verse six, for he raised us from the dead through that mighty power. He raised us from the dead along with Christ and through that same mighty power has seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. So if Christ has been risen from the grave and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and we have been risen with Christ and are now positionally seated with him, then whatever he's doing, we need to be about doing. That makes sense? That's kind of the premise. That's how I'm seeing all of this. So, Uh, As I mentioned, uh, last week was the gifts of the Spirit, but today we'll need the gifts of the Spirit to look at intercession and advocacy. That's what he's doing. That's one of the things that he's doing. At his ascension and enthronement, he uh, began a personal ministry of uh, intercession and advocacy for us as what's called our great high priest. Now, there's a lot that is probably technical when it comes to what a great high priest is or what a high priest is, but essentially a priest is someone who mediates between God and between man. And Jesus is the great priest, the, the, the greatest of all, the great high priest. It's like a triple, uh, I don't know, triple dog daria type thing. It's just, it's way more than you're thinking. He's the great and the high priest. So that's what he's doing. And I want you to see that. I'm just gonna read a few verses and just, and and let you be convinced by the scriptures. Hebrews chapter eight, verse one. Here's the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honor beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. Now, I want you to keep that verse up there on the screen for just a second. I want you to pay attention to that. Uh, The whole premise of this series that I'm working through or that we'll be going through is... uh, tying the work that Jesus is doing today to the ascension. And so I want you to see that this work of intercessory prayer, interceding on our behalf, serving as an advocate for us is directly tied to the ascension. That's the beauty of this doctrine. We have a high priest who ascended, sat down in the place of honor beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. So that's who he is. And it happened when he ascended into heaven. uh, Look at Hebrews chapter seven. This is uh, describing more about his priesthood. Hebrews 7, verse 24 to 26. But because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. Jesus, alive today, 
interceding with God on our behalf, praying for us, praying on our behalf. I mean, have you ever needed someone to pray for you? I know I've needed someone to pray for me. Who would be better to pray for you than Jesus? Who would have more of your best interest in mind or at heart than Jesus? Who would actually know better what to pray for for you than Jesus? So this really is good news. It needs to be. And if it's not, dwell on it all week long until it strikes you in some way, not just interesting, but, but glorious. Dwell on it long enough for you to fall into worship and thanksgiving to God. Don't just let this sermon pass. Don't just let this message and this moment pass. Dwell on the idea and the reality that Jesus is presently praying for you. I'm encouraging you to do that. It should move us in thanksgiving and gratitude. It moves us to worship. It moves us even with confidence. If he's praying for me, then I can move in what he's calling me to do, trusting that he's actually uh, working on my behalf through his prayers and intercession and advocacy. And I have nothing to fear when he's praying for me. And so I, I think this is motivating. But then I want you to see it's not just, there's, a, there's another layer here where Jesus actually sends us his spirit and he's praying for us. And I want you to see uh, just, just this sort of side note, if you will. But uh, there's someone else that's praying for us too. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 26. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. Can I just, I want to stop you there. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. Um, have you ever been in a, spa, a place of weakness or just, uh, let's just say, inability? Up against an obstacle Um, something holding you back, something preventing you, just some real trouble in life. And you're in a moment of weakness or brokenness. I think chances are high, if you're anything like me, then what I would like for God to do is fix it. Just fix it. Just make it right. Just take away the thing that hurts or bring me the thing that would help. But basically, if I'm in weakness, then the thing I need God to do is fix the weakness. Well, I think what's interesting to me is that in our weakness, God does the most powerful thing anybody can do when you're weak. He helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. So the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. In our moments of weakness, God does the most powerful thing a being can do to help. And it's to pray for us. Do you? Do you perceive prayer to be the most powerful thing you can do in a moment of weakness? Do you perceive prayer to be the most powerful thing you could do for someone else, interceding for them, as it were, in a moment of weakness in their life or brokenness? I gotta be honest, I, I, I haven't always seen it that way. Now, if you were just to you know, give me a pop quiz, I could probably get an A plus on, on the quiz. I could answer it correctly, but practically, functionally, the way my life plays itself out from day to day, there'd be days where you'd look at my life and say, now it doesn't appear from just the way it, looks and, and from his engagement in prayer that he would, would think that that was an important thing at all. He hasn't prayed. He, he hasn't devoted himself to prayer on those days. And so I'm challenged, like convicted and even inspired a little bit to see again, just renew my own faith in, in the power of prayer, renew my own conviction and determination to pray. Because when, when I'm at my weakest, Jesus Christ is praying for me and the Holy Spirit is praying for me. And then I'm going to go to Romans 8, 27, where the father who knows all hearts knows what the spirit is saying for the spirit is pleading for us believers in harmony with the father's will. So the father has things that he desires for us. 
Jesus is praying for those things. The Spirit is praying for those things. Who else needs to be praying for the things that would be God's will for your life? <laughs> you, you do. You do. And I do. I need to line myself up with what the Spirit of God is doing and what the Son of God is doing. And even when we don't know what to pray, the Spirit will pray for us. It's just so powerful. So good. Well, so that's in our weakness, but there's another uh, category. And we're, again, I'll talk a little bit more about this next week because Jesus is putting all of his enemies under his feet. One of those is sin. But I want you to see too that, that Jesus is our high priest who cares about us, not just in our weakness, but even in our sin. Even when we uh, disobey and rebel against God, whether it's in our hearts or outward expression of that, uh, I want you to see that we have someone who cares for us in those moments too. John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, My dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. In other words, I don't want you to sin. But just in case it happens. <laughs> but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. The one who is truly righteous. Some of us are truly righteous, so we're going to need him to advocate for us. Verse 2, he himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not our sins only, but, but, but also the sins of all the world. I think what's important for us to realize is that Jesus is advocating for us, but we're not the only ones, uh, not the only child he has, not the only ones struggling with weakness or sin. And he has also advocating for others too. And I think there's sort of a broadening of the horizon here to see that God is interested in interceding and advocating for more people than just you, although he is interested in you. But lining ourselves up with the intercessory uh, work and ministry of Jesus and lining ourselves up with the advocacy work that Jesus is doing is not just to benefit me, but me lining myself up with him and saying, I want to join you in this work of intercession and advocacy is me saying, because not only have you forgiven me, but you have forgiven others. You want to extend this work of intercession and advocacy to others. Do you see that? This ties to the last couple of weeks of messages where I'm talking, trying to convey that we have been, this is sort of a trite statement, but blessed to be a blessing. Saved to go out then and, and share this good news with others. All of this is really, a, a, the, we are sort of vessels through which God not only wants to, to clean and save and restore us, but so that through us, others will experience the same kinds of healing and restoration that we have experienced. And that's the beauty of this intercession and even this advocacy. So I think, I think we're all convinced that that's what Jesus is doing, but are you convinced that that's what you should be doing? Interceding for other people, advocating for other people. Well, just in case you're not, I found a Bible verse that I think is gonna help us with this, okay? This is 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verse one, I urge you, first of all, like the most important thing here, first of all, I wanna say this before I say anything else. I urge you, Paul writing to Timothy, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. All people that you like. I mean, I kind of had to throw that in there, you know. <laughs> pray for all people and give thanks for them. You know what happens when you pray for people? You do actually, you're, I don't know. I don't know if I'd say you start to love them. I mean, I do. I do. I sense that, but maybe there's a better, more technical word for that. But you know, as you pray for someone, your disposition toward them does change, especially if maybe there is tension or, or, or if they do frustrate you in some way. As you pray for them, interceding for them, Asking God to help them, asking God to show them, whatever it is you're praying for them. But as you pray for these other people, what you find in yourself is that your own heart is beginning to change and desire the best for them. This to me, I think, is, is just the, the incredible, just I think the incredible truth or reality that when you serve others, you, you, you get about as much as you give. Sometimes you get more than you give. 
And, and I think that's what happens here. When we look at others and we intercede for them and we pray for them, something changes and we begin to give thanks for them. We appreciate them. We appreciate what we're learning from them and how God has placed them in so that bring for them. I'm being changed. And of course, I'm praying that their lives would be changed too. Beauty here in praying for, interceding for others on their behalf and in even advocating for them. So there's a, few, there's a couple of things I'll say, but one is because it's Father's Day, you suppose I would say is the most powerful thing you can do for your child or your children if you have any. Pray for them. And what do you suppose might be the hardest thing for a lot of dads to do? Every day, by name, with specificity for the things they need help with. Think about that for a second. How well would you need to know your children to be able to pray for them, intercede for them like that? So the call to pray for someone is the call to know someone to enter into their experience, to enter into their world, to enter into their mind and their heart and to say, now, what do they need? You know, when I'm praying for me, I don't always know what to pray. So what does the spirit do? He helps. He prays for me in line with God's will. Sometimes I don't even know what God's will is for me in, in terms of just what next steps I'm supposed to take with big decisions. I'm sure we've all been there. The spirit prays for me. So it's like that a little bit too, you know, even with our own children. They don't exactly know what to do. They don't exactly know what direction to head. You train them up in the way they should go. You teach, talk to them. You find out what their personality is like and what their inclinations are like. You invest in them. You get to know them. And and on that foundation, the time you've spent investing in them and getting to know them, on that foundation, your prayers have uh, significant power. Now you know better how to pray. But, <clears throat> nonetheless, praying for them is the most powerful thing you can do. So I thought about a Father's Day message and I almost scrapped this series for just today and I thought, no, I'm gonna talk about intercession and advocacy because I don't think there's anything more powerful that a parent could do for their child than to intercede for them and to advocate for them. And not just earthly, I think also earthly, you know, with the school system or, or an IEP, whatever else you know that, are, that different kids need. Our parents should intercede and, and work on, our, on, on the behalf of their children. But I think it's also important if the one thing I had to say on Father's Day would be that we pray. Know them well enough, have spent enough time with them, seeking their best interest uh, enough to be able to pray meaningfully. For That's the most powerful thing you can do. Well, that's Father's Day, but you know, even today as I thought about uh, uh, Juneteenth and even Brian who mentioned it this morning, just welcoming you and recognizing Juneteenth uh, as a holiday in the state of Virginia, which I think was recognized last year uh, officially. I think that even when it comes to just days like that and even uh, people like, uh, you know, that we interact with in, in, in this country and even around the world, but especially when I think about even in our country and the division and even the racism that still exists, I think that it's important for us to take the posture of intercessors and advocates. Amen. I hope you agree with me. You didn't just tune in to CNN. This is the Bible we're talking about. All right? So don't just dismiss what I'm talking about. It's the same way and same posture we would have toward people who are different than us. Maybe they've got different experiences, different background, whatever it is. It's important to have the same as as having that posture towards your children. What's the most powerful thing you can do to fight injustice? the world, all the isms, it's to pray. But <clears throat> can you just, kid you don't know, didn't I just make that point? Can you just pray for a kid you haven't spent time with? Is that, that's good enough? Just pray for a kid. You're at work. You've been at work for, you know, weeks and haven't seen your kid, haven't put him to bed, but you know, you pray for them. So that's good. No, 
We're talking about meaningful prayer here, intercessory prayer that functions like advocacy. And, and I, I'm saying I want you to apply that to the people groups in our own uh, modern culture, our own time, in our own place. Apply that same principle. Here's the thing. I think a lot of us would rather debate than pray. I think that that might be the case. We'd rather like get into the intricacies and we're trying to figure out whose fault it was and how this happened and whose fault it's not and uh, all of this kind of uh, talk. How many of us are actually praying for reconciliation and restoration? Not just, uh, even though Juneteenth is a perfect day to really admonish our church to be uh, building relationships with and getting to know our friends who are black. No doubt about it. But I, I want to leverage this moment for getting you to see that you should be befriending people uh, of all kinds of backgrounds, with all kinds of sin in their past, with all kinds of... Not, not just so we can engage with them and, and be well-rounded as a person, which I think that, that has, you know, th that's a benefit of getting to know people who are so different. But if we are intercessors by, by call and by nature, because God has called us to do that, then we have the responsibility to get to know them, the responsibility to understand their plight, the responsibility to spend time long enough to understand some of the experiences that others have been through. And, and from that, we find our, our greatest potential in prayer ministry. So I would say this is true even about your neighbor. It doesn't matter to me what uh, background they have or skin color or maybe even what orientation they are. Have you taken time to actually just get to know them? I'm going to try to lose my job today. Have you guys taken time to get to know them? Maybe dug in a little bit into their past and see what has shaped their perspective? How can you actually even share the gospel with someone if you don't know what the good news would sound like to them? I mean, the good news is that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins and, and you can go to heaven when you die. That's kind of how most people would say it. Uh, I think there's a lot more to it than that. But in our culture today, you'll just have to forgive me. It's not good news for me to show up, sit down next to you at coffee at three ships over here or Starbucks or wherever, and just say, hey, guess what? Jesus died for you. I think the good news is commanding someone well enough to say, hey, Jesus actually died for that. He died to free you from that. It's understanding someone's story and experience enough to be able to apply good news with precision like a practitioner would to say, now I hear what you're saying and I've learned a few things and I wonder if Jesus would be a picture of this or if Jesus could help us. And it's pointing people to the good news and it not only helps us with sharing the gospel, but it gives us and it the ability to pray for them when we spend that kind of time being present and actively listening and in, uh, intending to learn from people that are different than us. You know what we find too, people that are different than us, is that we're not actually all that different. That's, right. That's the beauty of Jesus here. Is he different than us? Yeah. Do you know what my favorite thing is to say? Matt, you see it. It's yes and no. It's both and. It's yes and no. I want us to be a reasonable church. To be people who can reason and, and who can nuance and who can here and just say, well, hold on. Jesus is different than us. He's 100% God. But is he the same as us? Yes. In every way because he's also 100% man. I'm saying is, on the one hand, you could be completely different than somebody and still be able to intercede for them. And on the other hand, you might find that you're really not worlds apart like some would, would want us to believe. 
and we can intercede for each other in that way. I'm pushing us here. This is the work that Jesus is doing for us. He's interceding for people. And what kind of people is he interceding for? Client people? People, loving people? Uh, Good-natured and... uh, What I'm trying to say here is if he's interceding for me, he's interceding for a rebel. He's interceding for someone who is resistant to his work praying for me, and I am resisting what he's praying for. Just imagine that. But what if you actually want to to love someone and talk to them and get to know them and they resist you? Is that the end of your responsibility to them? We're joining Jesus in his work. What's he up against? We're up against the same things. You push through the resistance to intercede for And what happens in our hearts is that we begin to give thanks for them. We begin to appreciate. We begin to desire their best. We begin to want God's will for them. That to me is the best kind of missionary. And if we're joining Jesus on his mission to reach the world and to share this message that he is the king, ruler and reigner of all, then we need to to take up that mantle and and follow in his footsteps and be be doing the same kind of intercessory and advocacy work that he's doing today. So are we doing that? Are we doing that? I think uh, I want to encourage us to think through that and and even to give ourselves looking for uh, an example of this. You could study the book of Philemon. It's a one chapter book. So if anyone has resistance to that, I'm, I'm just probably going to be a little frustrated. <laughs> you can read the Bible. You should be reading the Bible most every day. But you can read this book. It has one cha- it's only actually one chapter. It's not multiple chapters. It's called Philemon. And Paul is pleading with Philemon, a slave owner, to receive his former slave back to him. Uh, but not, this time not in a slave owner-slave relationship, but in a brother, as a brother in Christ. So he's interceding for Onesimus. He's advocating for Onesimus. And I want to see that and then see what you can glean from that for yourself. So that's not my sermon, but it is one that you need to write. Study it. You need to think about it. Write your own sermon on Philemon. See what God doesn't show you about this kind of work that we can do for others. They're not wrong when they say we need more than thoughts and prayers. They're not wrong. But for us as believers, uh, we, we don't devalue prayer. We just, I, what I'm to convey is that to actually be able to pray for someone, you're going to need to do the hard work of getting to know how to pray for them. And that means listening, being open, and actually setting up some of your own to pick up for someone else. So I'm encouraging you that way. So I think what I mean too is that as we do this work, we stand in the gap, we pray for those who have no hope, we share the message of love and forgiveness to to people who are far from God. We do that and extend that to everyone because of Jesus. John Piper says it this way, we want to alleviate suffering everywhere, especially eternal suffering. So so we're not sort of abandoning the gospel and, and and abandoning the idea that we proclaim the gospel But we're also not going to abandon the idea that as we proclaim the gospel, we're going to meet it with, uh, like what the Bible says, with signs and wonders following. We're going to meet it with tangible expressions of the good news. I'll give you an example. The Bible says that God wants to have a relationship with us. How convincing is it for you to share with someone that God wants a relationship with them, for you to not extend yourself in a relationship to them personally? The message and uh, the, the ending and the message we're saying are not congruent when we're not willing to invest relationally and yet trying to convey somehow that God wants them relationally. Do you see that? Yeah. So what I'm saying is the message we send needs to be congruent with the message we say. So if God says, I love you, I need to show love. So I, th- I think that's, for me, one of the things I want you to see. We stand in the gap. We pray for 
who are suffering for injustice, but we pray and work towards salvation. We pray and work towards repentance for those who, uh, for those who are, are actually causing injustice. We pray toward reconciliation for everyone involved. There's another element here too of just praying for uh, the, the, uh, the suffering physically by, by engaging in the praying for healing and serving those who, who might be hurting. We, we intercede. There's another thing we can do. You could find your own examples of interceding and advocating for our friends who are having a disagreement. Over the years, the hardest thing I've had to do is to try to step in uh, a situation where a couple of people are having a disagreement and have to say, hey, I'd like for you guys to work that out. That's not a job I don't think any of us, um, you, you end up getting sort of bit on, on both sides. Um, but I, I guess what I'm saying is that's the hard work of being an ambassador for the king, an ambassador for the kingdom. We are agents of reconciliation. Our main job is to bring people together. So how crazy would it be that instead of bringing people together, I've discovered one of the sides that I like the best. And now I'm on their side and I see the other side as enemies of mine. You and I have lost our way as ambassadors for the kingdom of God if that's the posture we have in today's culture. We are bridge builders. We are peacemakers. We are ambassadors from another kingdom who stand and declare and demonstrate a different way of living, a different way of, a different way of behaving, a different way of relating. That's what the church is for. It's the beauty of the church. And that's why it's supposed to be diverse. If we're all the same, I'm not learning anything from you. <laughs> I'm just becoming further entrenched in my own perspectives and dogma. But if we are different and we are learning from each other, then I'm learning a few things about what it's like to live under the rule and reign of God in the family of God with Jesus as the uh, ideal father, with Jesus as the ideal brother, with each other learning that, that the dysfunction we grew up with is not appropriate for the Today, you cannot just give the silent treatment to people in our church. You can't do that. Amen. I don't want to have to be the one to say that. I want to fight for each other and say, you guys used to be best friends. Why are y'all not talking anymore? Someone's got to intercede. Someone's got to be an advocate. What I'm saying is as a church family, I want us practicing with open to each other, interceding for each other, advocating for each other, opening ourselves up to everyone in this community who would want to come and learn what it's like to live under the rule of God in the family of God as part of his community. I'm opening ourselves up to that largely because I think it's the only way we're going to really be able to lead for people the way Jesus is doing and advocate for people the way Jesus would want his body to do. Well, I think there's a, I, I've lost track of time. I may have, oh, I still have a few minutes, guys. <laughs> this table is blocking this clock and that communion table is blocking that clock. So you guys will just have to forgive me. Um, but there's another passage I want you to see. So First uh, John chapter four, verse seven to 21. Dear friends, uh, I'm going to read this, and I want you to hear. Oh, sorry. Before I read this, I'm going to give you a chance to get there. We're in First John chapter four. I'll be in verse uh, verse seven. As we read this, <clears throat> there's a line in verse 17 that I want you to see, and we'll get there. But the line in verse 17 is that we live like Jesus lived. So I want you to wrap your head in this as we read through this passage. How did Jesus live, and and what he did here in this passage is trying to show us how we should live because this is exactly how Jesus lived, all right? So uh, read this in verse seven. Dear friends, let's continue to love one another. That's what Jesus did. For love comes from God. And that's what Jesus understood. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And God 
much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. And this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Verse 11, dear friends, since God loved us that much, surely we ought to love one another. Just think about that for a second. God loved us that much. Why does it seem like he loved us that much? Well, if you don't realize the extent of our rebellion to God, the extent to which we will uh, resist what God wants to do, then it, it may not seem like it was that significant. But what I'm trying to convey to you is that he loved people who were dead him with sacrificial love and even gave of himself that he might be redeemed. And these weren't just who were asking for help either. In, in many cases, in most cases, these were people who had lived years and years uh, without asking him for anything, without acknowledging him for anything. These were what the Bible calls his enemies. Having loved his enemies, those who were opposed to him, he sacrificed and gave himself for us. Now that's what makes that so crazy. And then on that, he says, since God loved us that much, don't you think we can love each other? Even if there are things that drive us crazy about each other, even if there are things that are different, even if we don't agree on some issue, don't you think, given the extent to which God wants to love us and save us, that we, in his image, as his intercessors and advocates in his place, should and could do the same thing, love others? We should be so, dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. And God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. That's the beauty of the spirit. Verse 14, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the father sent his son to be the savior of the world. All who declare that Jesus is the son of God have God living within them. And they live in God, which means they should be showing love. Verse 16, we know how much God loves us and our trust in his love. Those are two different things. God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. Verse 17, and as we live in God, our love is growing more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. We can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in the world. How did Jesus live? Well, with confidence of God's love, he extended that love to others. That's how Jesus lived, as simple as I can put it. With confidence of God's love for him, he extended that love to others. And, and he says here that we'll have confidence when we love Jesus if we can live with a constant reality of God's love for us and a constant reality of the need to love others. Such love, verse 18, has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we're afraid, it's for fear of punishment and it shows that we've not fully experienced his love. We love each other because he loved us first. If someone, listen to this, if someone says, I love God, but they hate a fellow believer, is that, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he has given us this command, those who love God must also love God their brother, their fellow believers. What, what I guess I'm saying is it's just so easy to dismiss the other unless we realize that we are obligated to love them. To love them. And what if, just what if, since we're all, you know, of God, just what if it's true that I'm saying I love God, but I'm showing that I don't because I don't love other people? And it is true. What if Jesus is like them in some way? There's a, there's a story we won't get into where Jesus actually says at the judgment that you did not come visit me in prison and you didn't give me water when I was thirsty and you didn't 
come and give me food when I was hungry. And they say, we didn't see you. We didn't know that was you. How, that, that couldn't have been you. And he says, yes, it was me. It was me every time you decided not to visit those people in prison, not to give water to those people who were thirsty, not to give food to those people who were hungry. What's difficult for us is that when Jesus comes into the world, he doesn't come in as a successful, put-together person. He comes in and for whatever reason, aligns himself with the poor, the marginalized, and the oppressed, and on and on. The least, the last, the lowest. In fact, that's precisely what the religious people of his day couldn't stand about him, was that for some reason, he would constantly align himself with, with poor people, with sinners, and befriend them. And do you know what they accused him of? All the things that they had done. He hung out with people who drank too much. They called him a drunkard. Did he drink too much? No. But we just love to hate. And Jesus went through all of them. I, I, all I'm saying is, I, I, I'm careful about this size or maybe what judgment I, I give because Jesus always and almost always sides with, with the least, the last, the lowly, the lost. And so rather than maybe criticize or, or sort of distance myself from them to show what the differences are between us, what if instead like the heart of God, as we see in Christ, live like Jesus lived, I actually just come take a step over and just say, hey, I, I want to understand. I want to relate. I want to be a part. I see myself as really not that different. I see myself in need. I think there, in that space, we take on a ministry Jesus has as intercessor and advocate. The question is, you know, whether we'll just, uh, whether we'll take that step, whether we'll do that. I encourage you, church, to do that, to fight for that as a church. Lord, your work of advocacy for us, <clears throat> not just in our sin and failings, uh, but, but also in our weakness and in our brokenness, it's because you are different than us and kept reaching out and reaching in to help and to save, and yet it's also because you are the same as us. I pray, God, that we as a people would be authentic enough to understand who we are and, and, and what has shaped our perspective and, and also to take the time to understand who others are and what has shaped their lives. And I, I pray, God, that we would become true intercessors. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for being a father to us, God. Thank you for giving us a family. Relearn what it's like to live in a I pray today that we would take up the, the work that you're doing. Be so moved by the way you pray for us in spite of how we've responded to you, in spite of, uh, of, of other things in our backs. The way that you intercede for us and advocate for us. I pray that that would be life changing, eye opening. And then I pray that we would be emboldened and committed to being intercessors and advocates for our friends and our neighbors and our communities. Help us with that, Lord. Show us the way. In Jesus' name, amen.